very good morning to all. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Anita and thank them for taking the time to be here today. Today's talk is titled The Sea and the City. The city which is born out of the sea, the sea which harbored the port, the port which brought people, cultures, religious and economic prosperity to the city. The city we fondly call Amchi Mumbai is essentially a city by the sea and there is no Mumbai without the sea. The sea since long has impacted, influenced and shaped Mumbai giving rise to a whole ecosystem particularly rich in culture and architecture. Make markers of this rich maritime history continue to stand tall as silent sentinels amidst Mumbai's ever-changing urban scape, each with their own fascinating tale to tell, but have unfortunately either gone unacknowledged or have been neglected and forgotten. The sea and the city unravels these precious historic nuggets of Mumbai city which are deeply rooted in the city's cultural fabric and, its, and in its identity as the Earth's prima in India. Anita Gable has a BFA in Commercial Art from JJ School of Applied Arts with postgraduate diplomas in Advertising and Public Relations from KC College of Management in Art History from Dr. Bhav Daji Art Museum. She has been a museum docent with Dr. Bhav Daji Art Museum and a Pyramid Museum of Art. She has worked as an art facilitator with several children's NGOs. She is a history and heritage enthusiast conducting heritage walks in the city of Mumbai with a special interest in maritime history and is currently the vice president of Maritime Mumbai Museum Society, an NGO where she is actively involved in its education and outreach program. With that, I will now hand over the mic to her. So good morning everyone. Um, so I just want to uh, begin with a couple of uh, questions to which I want answers from you. Uh, because uh, something that you're going to see is uh, a little different from what uh, most of us uh, study or don't study through the course of our school and uh, college. So the first question uh, to you all is, uh, how do you look at Mumbai or what is your idea of Mumbai? Anybody can just answer randomly. As you know and as you live Mumbai, what is idea of Mumbai? Island. Anyone just quickly can. Island. Okay. Okay. So the, I, the, the uh, answer island was uh, a well thought answer or was it a spontaneous answer? Oh, well thought. Okay. Any other? Okay. Sorry? I can't hear. Sorry. Traffic. Okay. Sorry? Okay. Okay. What else? Are you all from Mumbai? Majority from Mumbai? Okay, so then I expect answers from those who are from Mumbai. What more do you think about the city? Okay. Who said coast? Okay, again, well thought or is it because you are seeing something related? Okay, do you see the coast? While commuting every day, do you see the coast? Why? Okay, so there are various reasons that why we Mumbaikas never look at the sea, uh, which is something that we will discover um, through my presentation. Uh, but uh, like one said coast, one said island, uh, just to briefly uh, uh, kind of <coughs> bring to your notice so that maybe tomorrow you will go out and actually observe uh, the city. Uh, we are a peninsula city surrounded by sea on three of our sides, west, south and east. But in Mumbai, being a commercial city, where it's a business city, where most people come only for work, everyone's just running and nobody has the time to look at the sea. The beach is next to you, but you will not look at the sea. 
the beach is there, but you will not go to the beach uh, for various reasons again. Now, that is uh, in depth, it, it has a lot of different layers of why uh, we don't uh, um, uh, look at the sea uh, from an entertainment uh, uh, perspective. But uh, since I am working on this project today, because I am connected with the sea, uh, and so the interest generated and so we are uh, wanting to establish a maritime museum for the city. Now that's the second question I wanted to ask. What is maritime? Does anyone know the meaning of maritime? What is maritime? Anything to do with ships. Uh, is it the ships? Ships or the sea. So maritime is everything related to the sea and there are various aspects that are related to the sea and that is again what we are going to look at. But uh, we come to the reasons why Mumbai is the way it is and that why we don't, uh, we don't have a connect with the sea, we don't look at the sea but the sea is the reason why Mumbai exists. We need to understand that. And it's the sea <coughs> which has created the city. Uh, Mumbai is essentially a port city. Uh, that apart, that the port which brought it the glory uh, as the commercial uh, uh, city of the country uh, is declining today for various reasons again. Uh, but it is a city by the sea and that is why I uh, call my uh, presentation today as Mumbai City by the Sea. So this is a small uh, uh, presentation, it's an audio visual. Uh, it gives you a kind of an overview of what I am trying to say and it will give you a preview of what's in the uh, presentation. So I'm just going to play it for you all. City of dreams, city that never sleeps, maximum city, Maya Nagar. Such are the adjectives she is recognized by. Her name has changed like none other. From Indonesia to Bombay to Bombay to Bombay to Mumbai. But what has remained constant is her geography, that she is a city born out of the sea and there is no Mumbai without the sea. While each one of us has our own connect with the city, how many of us really know Mumbai's journey from Bombay to Mumbai? Every city has her dreams of becoming a smart city and looks up to progress and development. What gets forgotten, unfortunately, is the development of its software, software that allows the city to thrive on its culture, entertainment, urban buzz, vice, social interaction, resulting in the much required economic activity as well. In order to make such a software available to the city of Mumbai, some like-minded people have come together to form the Maritime Mumbai Museum Society with the sole aim and dream to establish a world-class maritime museum in the city to acquaint not only Mumbaikars but also people from around the world of Mumbai's journey from the sleepy, obscure islands to Perth's Prima in Indies. The islands of Bombay, despite being so close to the ancient ports of the vicinity, which had a lively trade relation with the ancient ports of Western metropolis since long, continued to remain far and disconnected from the coastal trading action for centuries, except perhaps for a shelter in a storm. It was during the reign of Shidahara dynasty that the islands woke up to some activity. However, it was under the rule of Raja Bhimde that the islands significantly came to life. The islands which were till then inhabited by the Kohlis, who belonged to the Aboriginal Western India littoral, now saw an influx of the earliest immigrants to the city. The advent of Europeans on the islands forever changed the history of the islands. The political instability that prevailed under the Portuguese due to their forceful religious practices saw a change under the able and foresighted leadership of the British. This led to the rise of Bombay as the new headquarters of Bombay Presidency and a decline of the port city of Surat, leading to a sharp rise in trade, economy and population of Bombay, plus two, and its proximity to the cotton-growing hinterland. 
thus had many advantages over other ports on the Indian West Coast, aiding a rapid growth of the port and the city, making it truly the gateway to India. Although the economically viable cargo that brought the notable prosperity to the city of Bombay was being transported on ships built at the Bombay Dockyard by the Wadia shipbuilders, the local coastal trade on the coast of India since long was being carried out by a variety of country crafts built locally at the ancient coastal ports. Each of these country crafts had a history and function of its own and were known for their strength and durability. One such country craft, Fatimar, built in Bombay, Thana and Ratnagiri ports, considered as the best freight vessel on the Gokan coast, was chosen to become the mascot of our Maritime Mumbai Museum Society. The Fatimar built at a cost ranging from rupees 1000 to rupees 8000 with a tonnage of 60 to 100, although does not find a mention anywhere in the early Marathi records, was used as a mail carrier but later attained importance as a cargo carrier. It specially came into prominence during the Maratha Angre period and maintained its supremacy on the Kokan coast. Constructed with Malabar teak, balsal, or Gundi wood, it sailed well, carried a good amount of cargo, and was a pretty vessel with three masts and several jibs on the forecastle. They were used on the traffic southward of Bombay up to Cochin, but more often on the Bombay Marmagoa traffic carrying mostly food grains, salt, peace goods and other general cargo from Bombay and bringing back timber, copra, oil, pepper, sandwood, coconuts from Calicut and Cochin. Skillfully navigated by the Moklas and other coastal seafaring natives, the crew on board was about a dozen in number, including the captain, commonly known as Tandem. On the higher part of the deck, there was a peak to roof which was used by the crew as a cable. It would be lifted by disembarking the car. Depending upon duration of the journey, its roof was made of either a reka palm for longer voyages or of split bamboo for shorter voyages. To conclude, the history of circulation of people and commodities into and out of the port, city of Bombay, is intertwined closely with the sea. Built by its immigrant communities, overseas and coastal trade, shipbuilding, and the white coal boom all of which were connected to the rest of the world via the sea, the port city of Bombay metamorphosed from a cluster of islands into the financial capital of India. It is a sea which has influenced and shaped the city eventually. We at the Maritime Mumbai Museum Society want to share the lost stories of Mumbai's maritime past and point the way to our future as well. So come join us on our journey from Bombay to Mumbai. Support us in our endeavor to establish the Maritime Museum of the City, by the City, for the City. City of Dreams, City That Never Sleeps. by part uh, of the maritime history, but I also hope to, uh, I also hope to open your eyes and uh, start looking at the city from a different uh, lens, uh, if possible from here onwards. That's what this is all about. If I stand here, are you able to see? Are you able to see? Okay, so um, the sea and the city. So I love this quote, you can never cross the ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. Uh, that is the life of a seaman or a sailor and uh, that's how the journey, this journey of the maritime uh, heritage or history uh, begins uh, for the world as well as our uh, city. So this is what I uh, went into the introduction. 
uh, that the city which is born out of the sea, then the sea which harbored the port, the port which brought people, cultures, religions, and economic prosperity to the city. The city we formally call Amchi Mumbai is essentially a city by the sea and there is no Mumbai without the sea. The sea since long has impacted, influenced and shaped Mumbai, giving rise to a whole ecosystem and that's the ecosystem that we are going to look at today, uh, particularly rich in culture and architecture. So we are going to look at the architecture that's been inspired and influenced by the sea as well. Uh, I'm going to emphasize more on that. Uh, markers of this rich maritime history continue to stand tall as silent sentinels amidst Mumbai's ever-changing urban scape, each with their own fascinating tale to tell, but have unfortunately either gone acknowledged, unacknowledged, or have been neglected and forgotten. The sea and the city unravels these precious historic nuggets of Mumbai city, which are deeply rooted in the city's cultural fabric and its identity as the Urts Prima in Indus. So Urts Prima in Indus uh, is a term that was coined by the British uh, while uh, they were uh, ruling over us uh, during the East India time. And uh, it means uh, the first city of the country and the biggest city of the country. That was the vision of the British to create that city out of Mumbai or Bombay. Does anyone know, without reading, where does this lady stand? Has anyone seen? It's somewhere in Fort. I don't know the building, but I've seen oh, it somewhere. It's, it's, uh, it's yes. the PNC office. Yeah, so it is, it stands right uh, in, uh, it's attached of course, it's on one of the turrets of the uh, MCGM, uh, the PMC building as we call it, and she is termed as Urus Prima in Indus, the angel, the guardian and angel of our city. And the most beautiful thing about this guardian angel, this is where the story of Mumbai begins, is if you can, uh, is, which is the pointer, the top one? Is it? Uh, if you can see right on top in her right hand, she is holding a ship in her hand. And that acknowledges the fact that the city is surrounded by the sea and it is a maritime uh, city. So she is Mumbai's angel and uh, she's called the Urbs Prima in Indus, uh, which is the translation is the first city in India uh, in those days and was gateway to the world. So this is how broadly we are going to uh, look at uh, uh, the city. Uh, through its ecosystem that essentially the sea has created and it has nurtured over the years, uh, which is the coastal ecology, it's the people, the trade, the culture and the architecture. So first looking at coastal ecology and how, and uh, let me also tell you that all the five are interconnected with each other. There is a constant uh, connection you will notice between each of the facets and within the facets the various aspects that are there so all are interconnected to each other and at the end all are connected uh, equally to the uh, sea that the city is surrounded by so let's look at coastal ecology what is coastal ecology and how does it impact the city so it is the coastal ecology the geography and the geomorphology of Bombay that supports and links the entire ecosystem of people. It's because it is an island city. It is because it is a peninsular city today, no more island city as such, surrounded by um, uh, the sea um, on its three sides and uh, the various uh, uh, geographical features that is, it has, which has encouraged and supported a certain um, uh, system, uh, ecosystem. So it's uh, the ecosystem of people, communities, trade, culture and architecture together, each interdependent on one another and each connected to the most important factor of Mumbai's landscape ecology, that is the sea. So uh, 
first one is about the mangroves of the city, second one is about the, uh, the, the livelihoods, the jobs of the people, uh, people, the kind of people who migrated, the kind of people who are the indigenous community of uh, the city, that is the Koris, the Agris or the Bandaris who were working in the salt fields uh, or the toddy tappers. The mudflats uh, are, uh, are a home uh, to our coastal ecology or the flora and the fauna, etc. Um, mangroves protect the city from uh, uh, the floods, etc. But all this cover, of course, due to uh, progress and uh, uh, development and reclamations uh, is uh, losing, Mumbai is losing this cover. The rivers, creeks and lakes of the city, again, uh, form a part of this maritime because it's all to do with the water uh, in the city. So it forms a part of the uh, story, the Matrax story. Um, also notice how uh, uh, the beaches are placed. Can anyone uh, tell me what is uh, specific about this? The second map that you see uh, has the beaches of Mumbai. Can anyone say something about Are you unable to see because I'm coming in the middle of you? Are you able to see? Yeah. What side are the beaches? Western side. Do you see any beaches on the eastern side? So, uh, very naturally, the city of Mumbai uh, tapers down towards the west to the Arabian Sea. That's where you have the beachy uh, 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 sand, the uh, sandy beaches and rocky uh, beaches as well. So beaches and uh, some ancient ports as well and also uh, good, also interesting to notice how in the eastern harbour you have some of the islands of the city. You have the Elephanta, you have the Butcher, you have the Cross Island, you have the Middle Ground, the Dolphin Rock and Oyster Rock. So these are the islands again which uh, foster a certain culture. This is an old map, the first one, uh, which uh, gives an indication of the seven islands which are circled and the islands of Salset. Does anyone know what Salset means? So Bandara onwards, everything up north was called Salset. But what is the, uh, the Marathi name for Salset? Does anyone know? What were those islands called, Salset? It was Shashti, which is um, which was then uh, corrupted by the British, and they called it Salset. And Shashti means sixty. So there are sixty islands, which together make up the entire uh, what we call as the MMRDA today. So the entire metropolitan region of Mumbai. So uh, the second um, uh, map shows the port within the seven islands circle. Now you can see that the port is on the eastern side. So Mumbai has an eastern seaboard and a western seaboard. And it is the eastern seaboard, the third map with my arrow very clearly um, uh, shows the natural deep water and protected harbour of Bombay. So it was that natural deep water and protected harbour of Bombay which uh, fostered the port on the eastern border of Mumbai city and also if you see it's the mainland which protects the harbour and that is why it is protected and that is what ultimately uh, led to the growth and the prosperity uh, of the uh, city. Also notice that once upon a time uh, which is the this thing for the pointer? Does the pointer work? Does anyone know? Because is this the pointer? Is it pointing? No, wait, just wait to the next. Which is the pointer? Is there a pointer for it? Ah, okay, the last one. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, um, so once upon a time, before the, this reclamation took place, okay, before this reclamation took place, 
so if you look at this map, you can see that uh, the ships would come from the western, or you know they, or they came from what is called the upper, the north. So you have the Wasai Creek. Uh, and then you have the Sopara Creek, Thani Creek, etc. So this is the Thani Creek, of course. So the ships actually went all around like this and they sailed through the Thani Creek and they came out. It's very interesting, this bit of the history. Today, because of reclamation, this part and of course there's a huge silting, so no more ships can go inside. And also because of the reclamation, this part is whole very uh, narrow. And so now the ships come from the western seaboard and they come here and they go on the opposite side where the new Bombay is, where we have the new port, which is the Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust, uh, which is more important today uh, for, uh, for traffic, that is a sea trade, more than the Mumbai port. Because Mumbai port is actually dying because of silting. It, ha it is no more uh, that important as it used to be. So uh, now coming to uh, the Portuguese era. So when the Portuguese came to uh, India and especially to Bombay, they called it Ilha the Boa Veda, means the island of the good life. So they had noticed that Bombay has a harbour and uh, a naturally water protected harbour and that it would be uh, a good to kind of develop it. But that's where they kind of uh, left it because there were a lot of other um, uh, nations who were also trying to uh, kind of get their hands uh, uh, over uh, Mumbai. The French, the Dutch, the British, the Marathas, the Sindhis. So there were many contenders. Uh, to, uh, to kind of land on uh, Mumbai. Where, so while uh, all the uh, northern islands, while all the northern islands in antiquity, that is where Sopara was uh, a port in almost uh, 2000 BC. So we are looking at a 4000 year old history. While what was happening here in the islands of Bombay, uh, it was sleepy, sluggish, nothing was happening. There were only some local fisher, fishermen and the agris, police, etc. Uh, it just it was peaceful, quiet, uh, lying absolutely um, uh, not not seen by uh, anyone, not noticed by anyone. So what happens is the Portuguese notice it, okay, and uh, they kind of settle down. And this is one of the uh, first. Uh, they build the there is a European uh, so Portuguese Garcia de Orta who is a physician who builds a house which is called the Manor House which is a part of the uh, which still a part of it exists and uh, it is uh, in the Western Naval Quarters headquarters today uh, at Lion Gate. Uh, this is a part of that. This is a part of that. And uh, so the Portuguese come. They bring their people. They settle down. But there are two things which they do is uh, they force Christianity on people, so they convert people and also they uh, are into spice trade. They are not really interested in uh, governing uh, and uh, goodwill of people. But that changes when the British come in 1662. Uh, they come and then uh, they realize the importance. So the second governor of Bombay, who was Gerard Ongeo, who was called from Surat, uh, he, he, he sees the potential of Bombay as a great bay and a port and uh, he sees sailboats uh, over there and he says, okay, this is one city that can be developed into a big port town and it can be uh, a, a good uh, trading port town. And so there is uh, the, as you can say, there is the marriage treaty that happens in 1662 between the uh, King Charles uh, uh, and uh, Princess Catherine Braganza of Portugal. It's, a, it's actually a politically driven marriage treaty. And in Dali, the Portuguese give the island of Bombay uh, to the British. So it's only the island of Bombay and uh, not the rest of the seven islands. But by eventually, they do manage to take all the islands by about 1665. And then uh, by uh, 1669, because the king cannot look after the islands, he appoints what is called the East India Company. And the East India Company literally governs India for the next 200 years, up to 1858. 
So that's briefly uh, the overview of the uh, it's the coastal ecology governed uh, its growth. Second, we come to the people. So how people have influenced the culture of Mumbai as well. So the history of circulation of people into and out of the port city of Bombay is intertwined closely with the sea. The city of Bombay is built largely by its migrant and immigrant communities who were all in some way connected to the rest of the world via the sea. It is the sea which has influenced and shaped the city eventually. Just as there is no Mumbai without the sea, there is no Mumbai without its people. And this is something that we all know, what we call as the spirit of Mumbai. We all know that it's the people of Mumbai who are very, very important to the city. And uh, we call it a cosmopolitan city uh, because people from all faiths, walks, race, cultures have come and settled in uh, uh, our city from uh, everywhere at the call of the British in the 16th, 17th century. And uh, this is a very important uh, uh, fact to uh, understand uh, when I say uh, the city is largely built by its migrant and immigrant communities. These migrant and immigrant communities have no connection with the sea. And that is the reason why we today, we are all migrants and immigrants to the city. We have no connect with the sea. We are not maritime community. We are not born by the sea. And so we don't have a connect with the sea and we don't look at the sea. We don't engage with the sea. So these are some of the earliest settlers, the Kodis, the Agris, the Bhois, the Patharis. And uh, look at what I have said. It says early settlers and settlements. So wherever they settled, their community formed a settlement. So the Koris, wherever they lived, is called the Koliwada. The Agris, where they lived, they called it the Agripada. The Bhois, who were essentially also sea related, but uh, were uh, later took on the job as, uh, under the British as palanquin bearers. Uh, wherever they settled in the area of Parel, and that area was called Bohiwada, which exists even today. And Pathare Valley is where the more educated uh, of the lot came, the Patharis. This migration happened in the 13th century, uh, which was brought uh, by Raja Bhimdev. Uh, then came a second wave in about the 18th century. This is the new wave of immigrants to Bombay. They are native that is within the country hinterlands of Mumbai and the state of Maharashtra and overseas. And these were essentially traders. Mind you, I have kept on saying that Mumbai is a commercial town. It's a commercial city. So it is made up essentially of business communities. And these are some of the communities that came uh, to Mumbai from Kutch, the Bhatias uh, came. Uh, and they traveled everywhere. In their community, they were allowed to travel to Africa. We have this thing uh, in India uh, about your higher castes not allowing to travel across the sea because it kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's against the dharma, as they say. But these communities uh, didn't uh, have that kind of a, uh, superstition. Uh, so they kind of traveled to Africa, Gulf, Far East, the Jains, the Marwadis, the Shenglis or the Saraswat. So these are all the migrant communities to the city, uh, local communities. Then you had the um, Oswal Jains, the Memins, the Khojas, the Lohanas. They were all they all came here in the 18th, 19th century because of the famine and the drought in Gujarat. So they came here for uh, better pastures, looking for jobs and business opportunities. These again, so Mumbai was, Bombay was a huge craft, textile, indigo dye, block printing, embroidery industry, huge industry. And the, these were products that were being exported in the international market. They were very, very uh, popular in the international market. So these are the different uh, communities uh, that also uh, were living uh, in, in uh, the Bombay, in the town of uh, Bombay. The Parsis, now this is a very, very important community to the city as uh, they are one of the richest communities in Mumbai, but also the dwindling community in uh, Mumbai. Uh, but they, uh, the most important thing about Parsis is they brought their business acumen, 
also uh, um, they could get along with different uh, uh, nations and uh, they could ca carry out good business and they brought the most important thing to the city which is the shipbuilding uh, from Surat to Bombay and the first man who uh, did was the person responsible was Loji Nasurvanji Vadia. The warriors that we know today are the descendants of this warrior, and seven generations of these warriors, uh, from about 735 onwards, uh, built about 600 ship, ships uh, in the Bombay dockyard, uh, and they were literally famous the world over. They used the teak, the, Bama, the, the Malabar teak, and. Uh, uh, they were very, very famous. Even the British Royal Navy uh, placed commissions on uh, the Bombay uh, dockyard. The other important community to the city is the Baghdadi Jews. Uh, that is, uh, that the Baghdadi Jews came to Mumbai with the, um, with David Sassoon. And in the background, you can see the David Sassoon Library, which still stands today. And they were, again, uh, fantastic business acumen and they were in the tea, silk, opium, yarn, cotton, textiles, spices, muslins, you name it and they traded in all these goods across east and the west and the first opium war saw the fall of the Parsis and the rise of Sassoons. So all of these goods were traded first by the Parsis but then later on Parsis uh, moved away from this trade and it was the Sassoons who uh, took over. Now coming to the most important aspect, the trade, which is the economic aspect of Mumbai. The history of Bombay's trade goes back to antiquity. So when the islands of Salt were more active than the sleepy and obscure islands of Bombay. But the Mumbai we know today as the commercial capital of India rose to global prominence only with the advent of the Europeans on our shores and the trading communities that took commerce of the city to a new high to predominantly its cotton, uh, uh, cotton trade. So uh, what happens um, is, uh, uh, if, you, if you notice this aspect, 1869, when the Suez Canal opens. Do you all know the Suez Canal? Do you all know the Suez Canal? Geography? Uh, when that opens, it reduces the time of travel taken from Europe to India by half. So before this, the ships were traveling across the Cape of Good Hope, that is the African uh, southernmost point. When Suez Canal opened, that kind of opened uh, the gateway uh, to Bombay as well. Because if you visualize the map of uh, the world, um, you can see that India is in the center of the world and Bombay is within the center of the country. So it becomes a very, very important uh, port. So various things happening at that time, uh, important uh, things uh, happening, art institutions are established. Most important again, cotton uh, mill. The first cotton mill comes into 1854 and then there are about 100 cotton mills post that. Uh, also what happens is in between 1865 to 1870, uh, America stops because of their civil war, stops exporting cotton to England and who takes over that trade is Bombay which takes over. There was what is called the uh, white gold boom. So cotton is called the white gold and that boom is what brought uh, a really huge economic prosperity to the city and the growth kind of multiplied during those uh, times and Suez Canal added uh, to that and that's when this gateway uh, actually uh, which has come in much later 1924 and which saw the exit of the uh, British uh, when we got our independence but it's like a metaphor uh, to Bombay becoming the gateway to India gateway to the sea and gateway to the world. So there was no ship that traveled from Europe going towards uh, the east, towards the Southeast Asia, uh, which did not uh, uh, kind of made a halt uh, in Bombay. And that's how important Bombay becomes. It's this cotton mills. Uh, this uh, is uh, 
This is a picture of the cotton green uh, at Kolaba. But before that, the cotton green was at uh, near Asiatic Library, the Horniman Circle. This is the picture of that. Then it moved to cotton green, which is on the harbour line, the station on the dockyard side. And then finally, it moved to uh, Kalbadeh. How architecturally it has inspired is what I will just come to briefly. Fourth is the culture. Maritime culture on the coast of Mumbai has been a constant state uh, of flux owing to the millennia old trading traditions that fostered a constant circulation and exchange of people, goods, religion, clothing, food, ideas, language, etc. that influenced the local cultures, making them hybrid and syncretic. So in this presentation actually I have not taken the hybrid part and the syncretic part, but the culture plays an important role. Uh, the sea plays an important role uh, on the people influencing. So this is some of the images from the Kohiwada of Wali village, uh, where you have uh, very interestingly, if you see the name, how it influences the name. So Warlikar. So everyone is a Warlikar over there. But if you if they tell you the original surname, then they are giving out the caste, which they don't want to. So they call them Swiss Warlikar. How to differentiate which Kohiwada they belong to in Mumbai. So they call themselves Warlikars. Then you have this lovely Tulsi Vrindavan, uh, which you see locally, uh, which is also a cultural marker. So within this village, there are East Indians, there are Christians, there are Hindus. The moment you see a Tulsi Vrindavan like this, you know you are entering a Hindu section of the uh, village. Now this is another lost cultural marker. It is a Vaghar Daki. Uh, in the olden times, they used to uh, make starch uh, liquid of, uh, there's a tree called Agni, the bark of that, and they would make the starch liquid, pour it into this, and they had cotton nets. They used to dip the cotton nets in, so, into this tank, and they used to get starched, dry them, and use them. Today, it's all uh, plastic and uh, fiber. Uh, today, they grow plants in these tanks, because they are no more uh, in use. But the fact that such a cultural marker remains is, uh, is uh, it kind of gives an indication of what existed once upon a time. Uh, these are the houses, Koli homes are again very uh, peculiar uh, in architecture because they, uh, they have to, uh, they are built in such a way uh, to support their fishing industry. Then the festivals of Nali Purnima, and then the produce that's drying all over. You see, this is a scene that you see in all the Kolivaras, the Bombay ducks uh, drying. Then uh, the important goddesses of the city. First is of course uh, Mumbai Devi, which is the one which gives the name to Mumbai city. So uh, in, in Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, Mumbai was always called Mumbai. It was the name Bombay which changed to Mumbai in 1995. But otherwise Mumbai gets its name from Mumbai Devi. Then this is, uh, the second one is Golfa Devi which is at Bali. They are essentially tribal goddesses uh, to whom uh, the Koli uh, community uh, prays and uh, you know, they kind of pray for their safe uh, journey into the sea and back. This is Sri Kundi Devi again, which was prayed to by the pirates of the Malabar, uh, which is uh, close to Raj Bhavan at Malabar Hill. And this is the Khada Devi, uh, which was a part of one of the uh, islands of uh, Bombay. And coming to the last part, architecture. So, um, although Bombay's maritime history and heritage dates back to Sopara, Kalyan, Thani and Vasai, the waters that changed the future of the city were the natural deep waters of the Bombay Harbour that fostered sea trade. It was the British who capitalized on this opportunity and developed the port and established a navy to safeguard their trade. As an important port of call, Bombay became an important center for exchange and influence, architecture being one among them. Neoclassical, Gothic, Victorian, Palladian, Edwardian, the hybrid Bombay Gothic, Indo-Saracenic, and the Art Deco styles all merged into Bombay's landscape, giving rise to a beautiful panoramic view on the shores of the sea. So this is something, these are the different styles that you see uh, uh, essentially in South Bombay, of course, the Fort area. 
But we will now look at uh, the various aspects of uh, the architecture. So this is architecture influenced by the coastal ecology. Remember I told you that there are a couple of islands in the eastern harbour. Now this is, uh, this is the oyster rock. Uh, it is just opposite the Sassoon dock, if any of you know where Sassoon dock is in South Mumbai. Uh, and this was a defence structure. So uh, in the olden days, in the 18th century, 19th century, there used to be a lot of piracy in the sea. Uh, and also, um, this was used by the Navy uh, to protect the waters and the trade because uh, people like the Angres would probably come attack the ships, etc. So to keep the pirates basically off uh, the trading route, uh, this was used as a, a defense structure. And just for a little bit of uh, information, this is the island actually that we have got uh, in collaboration with the Navy to build our museum. So uh, we've got a formal permission now from uh, the government of India, the defense ministry. So this is probably where our museum is likely to uh, come. So this is the defense structure. They, uh, this is how that structure is. There are still a couple of guns over there, gun emplacements, etc. This is our team on the oyster dock. Um, uh, again, the forts that Mumbai has about 11, 12 forts. Some of them are lost, but they were all watchtowers for the city, built by the British, mostly. Uh, some were built by the Portuguese as well. But uh, Sivri Fort was uh, essentially um, uh, arms depot because it's far away from the city. So to protect the city from any kind of uh, eventuality in case there is a, a accident, fire accident, etc. Worley Fort was again more of a watchtower to look out into the Arabian Sea. Sion Fort marked the end of the Bombay Islands. From where even today, as you can see, people are standing. If you look down, it gives you a sense of what Bombay must have been 250 years back. It, the Mahim Creek passed by and it went round and uh, into the Thani Creek. So that is the sign for it. It was the lookout post. Even today, there is a dungeon over there, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was a post. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a custom collection post as well and a lookout post uh, as well. Uh, this is Fort George. So uh, there was a fort uh, in Bombay. Start, the, the area of the fort was uh, starting from Lion Gate uh, to where the Flora Fountain is today uh, and ended uh, opposite GPO at VT. So this is, has anyone seen this? Does anyone know? This is where the St. George Hospital is. This little remnant of that wall is still there. The Archaeological Survey of India, ASI Maharashtra Department sits inside this actually. So this is Fort George, it's still there. It's a remnant of uh, this 100 year fort that existed between about 1764 to 1864 approximately and gave the fort area the name Fort. Uh, coming to the architecture influenced by trade, so the trade was through the sea and to conduct that trade, Bombay needed bandars, docks, ports and there were institutions that came up with that trade. Um, so this is the naval dockyard. Has anyone seen the naval dockyard? No one has seen the naval dockyard? You, you've seen. No one has gone to the city side ever? Uh, okay, strange. But uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to throw you a question here. Look at the wall. Look at the wall. Okay. Uh, look at the wall and look at these maps. Okay, two maps, two old maps. Can you tell me something about the wall? How how does how has the sea defined the architecture. I have given you a clue over here. Look at the map and look at the wall and tell me. 
And what is that? Brilliant, thank you. So um, that's exactly what it is. This is one of the older curvature. Look at my uh, pointer, this curvature. So this is, of course, uh, I'll come to it, but the wall is across over here like this. So the wall, the circularity of the wall is defined by the C, which is inside, okay? So this is the naval dockyard. Um, and this is the clock tower of the naval dockyard. And this used to be the original entrance, but for security purposes, this has been uh, closed now. And the entrance is much further down south towards the um, uh, line gate. Uh, and uh, they were, th this is the Great Western building exactly opposite this, which was one of the Admiralty House, so where the uh, Admiral of the Navy back then uh, used to stay. This was also the High Court before the High Court came up actually. And then from here it shifted to the actual High Court. This also was one of the Admiral. So Admiralty House shifted quite a few spaces. So this is architecture of that. And uh, this is, of course, um, Loji Nisarvanji Vadia. And uh, I told you from about 1735, since he came, he was invited by the British. And later on, he was a carpenter, a carpenter who worked to build ships in Surat. He was invited with his team of carpenters. And later, he became a master ship builder. And his seven generations together, put together, uh, built about 600 ships uh, for uh, various uh, commissioned projects. Uh, they were for uh, Royal Navy, they were for uh, Prince and Princess in the country, and some private uh, organizations as well. So uh, it was the, and uh, if I, this is the Twin Comedy, and this is the Cornwallis. This ship, which was built in 1812, is still afloat as a museum in Hartlepool in London. So it has been restored and it still stands there. So 1812, just calculate how many years. This was built with Indian tea, uh, tea and that goes to show how well the Indian tea lasted in the sea, uh, in the seas. And uh, uh, this uh, lower one is Cornwallis, again built in the Bombay docks. Uh, this is on the ship, uh, this is the ship on which the um, first Opium War Treaty was uh, signed. So there are many important ships that were built in the Bombay dockyard. And this is the dockyard from inside. I conduct walks for students. So these are my students who I took them inside uh, once. So this dock that you see is one of the, this was built in uh, 1850 and next to it, uh, sorry, uh, 17, uh, 1760 and so this is the Duncan dock and next to it is the Bombay dock which built some of the famous ships and uh, the Bombay dock was built in about 1750. So very old, still surviving, still strong, still in use. Of course, this is the naval dockyard now. It is with the Western Naval Command of India, one of the three wings of the uh, India's uh, Navy. Awesome architecture of the uh, 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 dock. Uh, these are the bandars of Bombay. So this is what, uh, before the actual port came up, this is what the bandars would have looked like. And very interesting story about the bandars. So on the entire coast, there are bandars which uh, were named after uh, either the cargo that landed over there or it was some landmark or important personality. So I know you can't see her, but there is Timber Bandar, Hay Bandar, Coal Bandar, Kerosene Bandar. Uh, so, you know, the product that came there, Phosphorus Bandar, Manganese Bandar. So there are different Bandars. There's a Fishing Bandar as well, Cotton Bandar. So there are different Bandars like this all on the coast, the eastern seaboard of Mumbai. So starting from Sasuntok to uh, Sibri, Badala, the entire coast belongs to the Bombay Port Trust and is, uh, has uh, something to do with the, um, the port activities of the city. Uh, coming to Bandars, 
The gateway of India that we know today is also called the Apollo Bandar. But if you get down on the steps, even today you can see this. It was called the Wellington Bandar. This is a picture that I took just a couple of weeks back. It still there stands as a marker of what it was called. So this was called Wellington Bandar. And uh, just opposite Regal is this fountain, which is called the Wellington Fountain, which is the Shama Prasad Mukherjee Chowk today. And it was named after Sir Arthur Wellesley, who was the Duke of uh, Wellington. Remnants of history. Now this is a very interesting uh, history again. So before the Bellard Pier, who knows Bellard Pier and Bellard Estate? I'm sure at least you have heard of the place. The Bellard Pier and the Bellard Estate that came up here, before that, there were all ports here of different towns. Can you read what the towns are? There is Cochin Street, Calicut Street, Goa Street. Uh, there are six streets here. Uh, they are named after the towns from where the boats used to come there. For This is the coastal trade. This is not the international trade. This is not across the oceans, but this is the coastal trade. So ships coming from there would land here. There was all sea here, this was not reclaimed by them. And so the people coming from those places would stay on these streets, they would have their own restaurants, food restaurants. The first street is called the Cochin Street, which still exists. If you go there, you can see this main plate. I just took a picture of that uh, recently. So interesting street pattern, street may see. Uh, again, uh, Battery Street, Henry Street, uh, named after the people who were involved uh, in some way or the other with the city. This is the famous Sasun Dock, uh, the southernmost tip of the Mumbai's port, uh, which was built by David Sassoon's son, Albert Sassoon, and it was a private port of theirs, and they made a fortune by using this port uh, for their cotton and opium export. And uh, of course, the government realizing that uh, Sassoon's are making too much money, so they uh, take over uh, the port and uh, it becomes with the Bombay Port Trust later on. And today it is one of the biggest fishing docks uh, of uh, uh, Mumbai. It's beautiful. In Bombay we have what is called the Sassoon Dog Art Festival, uh, which is conducted here, which is absolutely fantastic. It is to revitalize, uh, reimagine these uh, spaces which are otherwise defunct. Uh, this is the Bhausa Dhanka or Ferry Boy. Uh, they are filled up, they are reclaimed and uh, there is news that they are going to be excavated again to make it into a marina and shift all the boats that you 